Okay, thanks, Kevin. And um, it's, it's great to see everybody. Um, so Jess, I know, obviously, and Philip, um, I've run across. Shannon, I don't know that we've met. That's a, no, no, I'm uh, down in Geelong with uh, Steve Moshner. I only just started, I'm a, I'm a newbie to the Ovo land myself, so. Did I, did I hear you playing at one point? Yeah, I think you did actually. I think yeah. you might have examined me for my yeah. exam, there you go. <laughs> there you go, then I, <laughs> <laughs> then this is, <laughs> there you go. And Amanda, I, I recognize you, but I'm not quite sure where I've run across you. So um, anyway, the, uh, the, 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 I guess I say that the starting point for actually thinking that I would do this was um, I started seeing a number of ads coming up on AMUs for woodwind teachers and none of them mentioned oboe. They were all, they were all saying, oh, you have to be a woodwind teacher and, and we require flute and clarinet. That was basically it. And I thought, well, where are the oboes? There were, there were, for me, there were two explanations. One was that the oboes were already very well catered for. The other one was that there just aren't any young oboists and bassoonists getting started up on a regular basis. So I thought that it might be um, worthwhile just uh, having a little look at um, the, the place of uh, oboe and bassoon in, the, in schools in particular and just have a look at um, issues that are around uh, having these, inst these instruments taught in the school program. Obviously, there's, uh, there's some schools which have extensive music programs and have a lot of double read in there already. And I can, uh, I'm, I'm happy, happy that I'm teaching at three of those schools, for example. I know that, Philip, you've got a very big program going at your school. Um, and so uh, there's, I'm at Melbourne High School and Scotch and, and, and Trinity, all of which have big programs for the, for the double reads and uh, also all the other instruments. And there are a lot of, um, uh, there are, you know, obviously Melbourne High School is a public school, but it's the, uh, the year nine through, uh, through 12 a specialist school and they, they really push music, but there, there are others, a lot of other um, public schools around which do have one or two um, oboe players around and bassoonists. And there are a lot of schools too, which have music programs, which don't actually have double reads. So uh, I guess um, that some, some of this may be actually just preaching the converted because uh, you've already got the programs up and running. But uh, I started off with, with this sheet by saying, are double reads too much trouble taught in a school program? And that was to particularly geared for anybody who was in a program where double reads just don't figure and just looking at maybe why this why this might be and I, and when I was thinking about it it was basically because of the issues that are attendant with the, the starting a double read player and these are the, these problems are the range from just simply logistics like having a suitable instrument to um, the the sort of sounds that these beginner uh, players make what can you do with them in when, when you try and incorporate them in an ensemble and they sound appalling? Um, and uh, let alone, how do you get them taught when you don't have a specialist teacher available? Uh, so um, I, I just looking at the assembled people, I don't think that uh, that, that is too much of an issue with, uh, the, with where you are. But I must say that uh, one has to bear in mind that these days, um, playing double reed instruments is a very different thing from even 10 to 15 years ago. The technology is, is now so much more advanced than it was. And the, uh, the, the, it's not hard to get hold of an instrument which works very well for a variety of ages now, whereas it, it used to be the case that uh, it was almost outrageously expensive to get a decent instrument. And, uh, then, and even then, uh, trying to get one that wasn't going to, to have issues was uh, a very big problem. The other thing is about reads. Uh, it, it, you can you used to be able to number on uh, less than one hand the number of different types of reads that you could commercially buy. When I was starting off many, many moons ago, um, I was reliant on the reads of my, of my teacher, and there was a, a virtually no possibility of buying a, 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 a going to a shop and buying an oboe read. It just didn't happen. But now, everywhere you look, there's a company that will sell you a read. 
and uh, you can there must be something like 50 60 different types of reeds bassoon and oboe that you can get hold of so the, the, there's a, a vast array out there of possibilities for getting suitable equipment. And not only that, but some of it is actually cheaper than if you're going to actually uh, service a clarinetist, for example. The uh, an oboe reed, a bassoon reed lasts for a very long time, well looked after, whereas a clarinetist seem to be constantly churning through their reeds. And when you add up the cost, you probably find that it's actually more cost effective to service the double reed community than it is the single reed community financially speaking. Okay, so these, these days, uh, the, uh, what, what we generally struggle with in schools is leftover instruments from previous ages, which should be pensioned off. And to my mind, the, the thing which is the biggest obstacle to having a, a burgeoning double reed problem is kids who think that oboe playing or bassoon playing is a real hassle because their instrument is either not working correctly or is constantly breaking down, or that they are trying to use reeds which actually are not particularly suitable for what they are trying to do. The other big difference between maybe even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and now is that there's a different mindset, I find, among students. There's the idea that they can pick something up and do it immediately is alive and well now. Whereas before, it was sort of accepted that you might have to struggle along and get used to something and put up with something. Um, particularly as we now are starting uh, with year grade, with grade four programs in schools quite often. Uh, that's the, the first experience that the kids are having with double reads might be at, um, in, in the grade four, which is very young. Uh, whereas before it used to be accepted that there were double reeds, uh, particularly with oboes, you didn't start it before the age of about 12, 13, and bassoons even later than that. Then, um, you know, uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, very young children who don't have a concept of actually persevering unless they really have a motivation to persevere. And so this notion of actually having equipment which works and which will give them results which they will actually feel comfortable with immediately, I think is the bottom line in any double read program for any school in any situation and also in private teaching these days. And because of the, the, the that we now have access to really good instruments at reasonable cost and to good reads which will work, uh, there's really not much excuse now to not have that available the only thing is, is that you, uh, a, a school program where you are actually stuck with a whole batch of instruments which are beyond their use by date and a limited budget. And so uh, to my mind, that, that, that is really the, the only impediment to getting a really good program up and running is actually to, uh, the effort of getting the equipment right, right for the start. And I might jump in here because Philip's yes. got a question that is that is basically on the topic that we're talking about. And one is the recommended starting age. Is you started to talk about at what at what age should we start um, with an oboe or bassoon student? And your thoughts on plastic instruments. Great. What fantastic questions. Okay. I have my starting tool here for a beginner oboist and bassoonist, and it's this. If they are capable of blowing up a balloon, they can play oboe and bassoon, no problems. In fact, the youngest, the student, the more lung power they're likely to have. I've just got to get it in front of me like that. Uh, the, both of the instruments are basically stick it in and blow instruments. And when, when kids get to around about the age of 11 or 12, when the critical mind starts to kick in, they quite often at that point stop blowing freely because they get worried about what the, the sound is that they're making. And they, they have a critical, a, a, a judgmental point of view quite often on what they're doing. Whereas with the young kids, the grade fours, they have no idea. They are not worried in the slightest about the sound that they're making. They, if they can blow their balloon up, they will just puff air into their instrument and off they go. And all you have to do after that is to help them to, to take the rough edges off. So I'm, I have no trouble. I've started off kids in grade one 
fact, and once, uh, just to be a little bit anecdotal about this, I had a, a father who brought along his twins in grade one and wanted them ha to have them taught. Finally, the father rang me up and said, look, we've got to stop the lessons. This is too much for me because he thought that they were going to have lessons and they were going to go home and they would get their instruments out and they would practice and he would sit in a gloating fashion um, in a corner of the room somewhere reading his book. He didn't, he hadn't factored in that their young children actually need an awful lot of parental help just to manage their practice, manage their, uh, their use of the instrument and manage their operations because that is the only impediment to a young student starting is just that they, they need consistent monitoring and guidance. And it's not until they get to high school sometimes that they're able to be um, self-motivating uh, and that they don't need assistance. And uh, so uh, for, for me, the, uh, the, uh, the young students come as a, as a team. And it's, it's quite essential that that team is in operation that the parent doesn't necessarily have to understand particularly what's going on, but they have to be prepared to assist with making sure that practice happens and to assist with making sure that the, the, what the, the teacher is actually asking the child to do is, is being actually followed through. Okay, I hope that answers that part of the question. Philip, is that, was there anything else you wanted to- uh, That's good, Anne. That's good, Anne. I, I wonder if, um... So you're quite an advocate for kids starting early. I mean, it's something I hear teachers debate quite a lot about the starting age of piano, starting age of double reads. Does it, if it doesn't go well, does it turn kids off? I mean, it's always the great debate. Do you start your violin kids in year two or year three? Um, so it just, just been interesting for me to hear that. And what's your thought on the use of plastic instruments? Um, there's plastic instruments and plastic instruments. No, there's even plastic reeds, but actually they're fiberglass. Um, it's, um, I find that for, uh, if you get a, a, a good instrument, I'm going to show you one here. I don't know if it's going to come up probably. This is, this is a, a synthetic oboe. Um, that's my background is fantastic, but you can see that it's a very simple system oboe. It's got absolutely minimal key work. It's designed for a very young child to be able to play. It's got all the key work they need to get up to grade four, A and B. And it's just, it's like, it's very light. It's made of plastic. They can drop it. They can, um, they can get, get putting it together wrong. So that they, so that it's, uh, they, so that they, they, they hit, uh, they're threatening to hit keys. They can, um, uh, look at an E flat, and they can play an E flat, which is when you have to get out there with that key here. With the, so a very little hand is able to cope with this. There's there's two main brands of this instrument. One's called the Rocket Oboe, which is made by um, John Armstrong, now in, now living in Russia, in Moscow, and um, uh, and the other ones are made by Howard. You know, the 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 the, the uh, this is called the this is the one that um, I tend to use because it's. Uh, well, it's actually cheaper, which is <laughs> the, main, the main reason. But if I've, uh, I've, uh, in the schools I'm at, we're stocking up the, the junior school areas with these instruments so that kids uh, can actually play them with minimum fuss. The, the worst thing that happens on oboes with a full kit and caboodle like this is that they're actually very heavy. They weigh over a kilo. And they also, um, there's a, there's a the problem that there's the key work is adult designed for adult hands. When, you, when you're in a band situ situation, I'm, I'm, I'm going off the topic of the, um, the, the plastic, so I'll return to that because we'll come back to all of this. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with the, the sound of the plastic oboe when it's got a proper bore on it. Okay, it the bore is the essential thing. And when you match a, a suitable reed in the top, which you have to do for any, any instrument, any oboe, no matter what it is, you have to make sure that the, the, the reed matches because the, the staple, which is what the cane is tied onto, which fits in the well of the oboe, is actually part of the bore of the instrument. And so that taper of, this, of the reed needs to match the rest of the instrument, and it doesn't matter what oboe you're playing, that's the case. Yeah. Yes, Philip? Um, so, and is there a sort of a level of proficiency at which you would want to or need to steer them away from a plastic instrument? 
they may never go off a uh, synthetic instrument. They might go yep. to a better quality one. Um, yep. I've just moved off my buffet um, uh, uh, instrument, the Orfeo, which was a, which I played for about 15 years, which was fully synthetic. Yeah. And uh, the, the advantage of it was is that it did not, like, unlike wood, it does not change shape given the, um, yep. the atmospheric conditions. And is there a synthetic option for the core anglais? Yes, there is. Righto. I'm filing all of this away. Yeah. Excellent. Most people don't play the synthetic one um, but because it's just not, um, it's not become that popular yet. But, but, but more and more people are moving on to synthetic oboes. Okay. And uh, uh, it's not plastic plastic. It's actually a, a synthetic material. You know, so yep. it's, not, it's not Tupperware. Put it like that. And what sort of cost would a, a you know, a decent one be? Um, a cor well, cor anglais. A, a decent cor anglais. Well, it, um, they they can go up to fifteen thousand or so. Uh, Jess, what have you bought one? Haven't you? What did I've you pay? A, what did you pay well, for yours? I, like it was, it's wood, fourteen and a half. But that was a few years ago now. Yeah. You could get you could get a John you could get a John Armstrong a Tony a, a just called an Armstrong Ward Cor Anglais which is actually a wood one you can get it for around about the a nine I think eight nine mm -hmm. and that's a, and that's a, that one is very interesting because uh, one was taken over to Russia and it was it was played in a double blind test against the other top brands and um, that that instrument uh, that he makes was chosen number one out of Marigo Rigata Lore the lot. And the particular instrument is now owned by Scotch, by the way. That particular, the, the one that was actually tested, yeah. But so, so if you're looking for a core anglais, then I would suggest that. But there, but you will find um, other options. That's a fully professional one with, with at a low price. But yep. you will find cheaper ones, and you will find synthetic ones, which with with limit more limited key work. And so on. But I would, but I, but to my way of thinking, that that core anglais. I mean, I don't want to uh, sound like that. It sounds like I'm doing a, a, a trade plug here, but in my experience, that that is the one that is the most cost effective and best sounding, the most reliable that I've that I've come across. Yeah, righto. Thank you. And you can find other ones. Yeah. So, is there anything else that? Um, yeah. Anyway, so, so that's Cassie, all. That's all on that that little topic. That topic. I think we covered that. Yeah. So let, let's let's move on in. Let's go. Okay. Okay, so anyway, who plays double reed instruments? Well, um, it, 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 it used to be that um, people thought that double reed players had to be geniuses, otherwise how could they survive? Um, you know, you had to be a giant because otherwise how are you were going to get around that key work and play the band music? Um, but basically these days, um, uh, I find the most the successful way of recruiting in the school setting is actually to get a, someone who, uh, one of the student body, if you're lucky enough to have oboes already get there, get one of the student body there uh, who plays good oboe and take them to the junior school or the year seven and get them to play and say what fun they're having. And then you'll have, then generally you, you start having people lined up wanting to play. And all uh, that they, it just has to be made easy for those people who put their hand up then to actually get an instrument which works, get a read which works, and get going as soon as possible. Because as I was saying, they, they, want, they want things now. And so the, the idea of following up immediately um, when there's a recruitment program uh, uh, on foot is, is really important. Um, and it's a, very important to get the parents on side, I find. Uh, it doesn't really matter what age it is, but the, the parents are the ones who are going to be paying, I guess. And so it, it uh, they uh, quite often they sort of, I find they're left out of the equation a bit. So I think the moment someone's expressing interest, then there has to be uh, approaches made to include the parents in the conversation right from the, the get go, because uh, it might be actually completely uh, not what they want their child to be doing, and it's better to know now than later on. And <laughs> so we don't want any tears. But also they probably don't even know what an oboe or a bassoon is. And then so uh, particularly the bassoon, they find quite scary because it's, uh, it's uh, such a, a big instrument. And also when it comes to buying uh, a bassoon, uh, then uh, the suggestion that a parent should buy a bassoon is, is a very scary proposition because they are expensive. Uh, some, but you can, you can find cheaper alternatives. And particularly in the junior school, 
uh, area, then you, you might be like to consider things such as the tenor rooms and the, and the uh, fagottini for the, uh, for the young ones. Have you run across those, those instruments, those bassoons? Do you know about those? Yeah, I think people are calling them tenor runes more and more because of the implications of the fagottini word. So, but they're but overseas, they're definitely called fagottini. The, and the, the fact that they um, are in F, though, is, a, is the, the tenor runes is a bit of an issue. Uh, there are attempts being made to actually uh, generate music, ensemble music, which is, um, you know, transposed into the right key for the for the kids to play on the uh, on the tenoroon, but the trouble is, is that they actually do work the same as the the, the bassoon with the with the fingering, and so uh, once you start doing the transpositions, you are getting into the keys which they don't like playing, you know, because of the uh, because of uh, various issues with uh, cross fingerings and so on. So for the absolute beginners, that the, the tenoroon isn't isn't really great as an ensemble instrument unless you've got other tenoroons there. And so the successful programs with tenoroons in schools had tended to be where there's where there's groups of them playing. And so they, they stay grouped as tenoroons until they actually gravitate onto a the, the normal bassoon, and from there they get included in the in the uh, the larger school ensembles. So so I find personally that tenoroons are a great way of starting small small kids because uh, and they and they love them because they I'll show you. Have you seen pictures of them at the Tenaroons? I've got one here for, which I can throw up if you're interested in seeing the size of them. I've just got to work out how to manipulate all of this. Okay. So come up in a second. So if I if I share this um, screen, um, I don't know if that's if this is going to here it is. It's this one. Okay. Okay, so does that, does that there, there shows the, the relative sizes. Okay, the, that's the tenor in the number two from the, the one from the top, the second from the top. That's the regular bassoon, soprano sax, clarinet. Okay, so so that 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 uh, tenor in really really is a, a a really great option for the younger child who who you want to in, uh, involve in double read playing you know I've, I've had one who took part in an on uh, in a junior school band program in grade four and grade five and i must admit it was a bit of a challenge but we just allowed them to play at the at distance of a fifth to everybody else that seemed to be the only way to, to, to handle it in the end because uh, trying to get the trying to transpose the music was not um, a really good option All right, okay. So um, apart from that, uh, the, the, the band's programs I find in the junior schools are a good way of starting where you just simply allocate people to instruments. One thing that uh, I think we've got to watch out for though is that uh, quite often when you're, when you're looking at starting off children in, in schools on double reads, they've already been, uh, there's already been a, a, a a cull made of the student population by string players in particular. So you find that um, the, the string programs tend to start very early. And so if, uh, you, uh, what you're sometimes left is uh, the so-called leftovers and the newbies to the school. But on the other hand, um, I, I always think that this may be the case, but it doesn't mean to say that you're not going to find good double read players. Because if you're on an instrument which actually works very well and you've got decent reads, then it's possible for, for young, uh, young people um, who, are, who are refugees from other programs, let's say, which happens through, from the string program or 
whatever, or no longer want to play the clarinet or, or something else. So they, they will make a success of the oboe uh, if, the, if the conditions are right. And also if they're allowed to develop well. And this is uh, where I, I need to uh, maybe move along here onto uh, what it means to actually teach these instruments. Um, I've got down there under teaching these instruments the, uh, the development curve, short-term pain for long-term gain. I find that uh, teaching double reed and particularly oboe is very much like a J curve. You may spend, a, a, a child that, that picks up an oboe for the first time at, uh, in, a, in a school, you may find, let's say they pick it up in year seven. It might be year 11 that, that they finally hit their straps. The, the, the thing that is, uh, I find is that you really have to look at not demotivating the double reed players before they get to that point, because they look at their clarinet and their flute colleagues, and quite often they will feel that they're not doing very well. But um, I, in my opinion, the oboist progresses there like this, very slowly, and then suddenly they'll, they'll shoot. Whereas the other instruments will tend to have much more of a curve which goes like this and then plateaus out. And quite often you'll find that the, the flute and the clarinetist, the, which are, I find fundamentally far more difficult instruments, much easier to start, but much harder to get to a high level on. They, most of them will actually you have rapid progress and then they'll plateau out, whereas that, that lonely oboist and bassoonist who've been doing their J thing will at this point go further ahead. And there's two reasons why that may happen. One is that, they, that you've got the ones that actually have persevered. And so you're looking at the ones who actually have, have, are committed and, and keep going, and they have got through the hard patches. And you, may, and you may have dropped off in the meantime, a few who actually aren't going to be that committed and actually aren't going to really give it their, their best shot. And so the, the, so the cohort is actually, the, if you like, the gene pool is actually a, a bit stronger by the time you've got through a few years than maybe the gene pool on the, on the other instruments. Um, I'm trying to say that in a way which doesn't sound either racist or provocative. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, th I really think it is, a, it's not a question of talent so much as a question of commitment and perseverance. And the oboes who persevere tend to, to they, they, they tend to clump and then go on. Okay, the, um, so it's up to, it's up to the, the people around these young, these young players in the early stages to actually be understanding and understand what, what the, uh, the players are going to go through to get to this point. One is that they have to grow. Okay, I've talked about these little instruments that, uh, that the, the very young people can play. Well, it, it ultimately it does take a, do, a bit of strength to actually hold that instrument up. And so, so what I use for the young, the young ones is that, um, I don't know if you can see this, but I use a pole which attaches to the, to the thumb rest. This happens to be one that attaches to a ring. There's another one which is a hook affair. So you can actually, I don't can you see this? Uh, I attach it to my oboe, stand like that, and then I rest it on rest the rest the end of it on a chair and playing. You can play sitting down and take the whole weight of the instrument off the hands. And this is a this is a lifesaver for these transitional periods in particular. Now, just like you never see. Um, grade ones and grade twos at school in nappies or even preps. You know, they wouldn't be seen dead in nappies at school, but they might have to wear them at, at home for so odd occasions. Then the, the young oboe who's got the pole ultimately wants to get off it. So you're not looking at someone who's going to be sitting in year 12 with their, with their post and having to place him down all the time, unless there's an issue with their hands and it's actually to their advantage to actually do that. Okay. So um, for the, for the, particularly in the junior school and in the beginning phases of high school, you may, I found that using the post on the instrument really assists things and stops tension. And tension is the big thing in double reed playing. And that's the oboe. They're, obviously the bassoonists have seat straps and they have neck straps. 
So they, they, there's already accepted there that you will have an assist to hold your instrument. But with the oboes, it's, it's not generally accepted that you will have an assist. And if people, and people quite often think about using a neck strap, but neck straps, in my opinion, on an oboe, and even on a bassoon, I'd go for a seat strap anytime on a bassoon. Um, the neck strap, it, it, it does tend to cause the neck, if you're not careful, to actually move forward and introduces problems with the support system because the head is unbalanced. And you can try that for yourself. The moment you push your head forward, you'll feel your, your abdominal muscle seize up. Okay. The biggest thing, the, the one, one of the big aha moments I had was when uh, an Alexander person came and did a, a, a session at one of the schools I was at and started talking about the spine and about where the, 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 the top vertebrae is on the, on the neck, which is actually at the point where the skull if you draw your finger down the back of your head, there's a, the, where, the, where the bone finishes, uh, that, that's where the top of the spine is. And if you just simply balance your head on that, on that C1, you have to, it, it's a little, because you can't see it, it's a little bit of a visual imagination thing. But if you do, you'll discover that the entire body just locks into place. And I, I, and I find that I, know that I don't have to talk to kids about posture. I have to talk about have you got your head balanced. And if they get it balanced, the entire posture thing is, is they don't have to think about it. It's, it's just, it's just happens. So you just give them that mental image of where C1 is, balance your head, and then make sure that, uh, that the oboe isn't causing them to do that. And so with the post, you can actually uh, enable them to remain um, pretty relaxed and... This means that what they were doing with their balloon, which was just to stick it in and blow, they can just apply that directly into the oboe without introducing tension. One of the things you can do with your balloon, and it's worthwhile trying this, is, it, is to blow a balloon up and see what happens when you clench your hands, for example. If you just blow it, almost gone. I was too relaxed, I'll get another one. Okay, I'll just blow it. <coughs> now, I'm not going to fake this. I'm going to tense my hands and my shoulders up. And there's virtually no air getting into my balloon. Now, that's the equivalent of the reed. In order for the oboe and the bassoon to work, you have to get air into the reed. The thing that stops it generally is not, is not a lack of blowing, it's, it's tension in the upper body. And so anything that reduces that tension is good for your future prognosis on the instruments. And, and it needs to be, and that's the main thing you have to watch. If we, we, people talk about embouchure. Embouchure basically should just sit there with a mouth shape. Embouchure should basically just be a quality control on, on the vibration of the reed. The business of blowing is just simply to stick it in and blow, and then you just monitor what you're doing and don't interfere with the process as much as possible. So there's two, there's two areas of strength in, in playing the, the, the double reed instruments. One is, the, is maintaining the mouth shape, which shouldn't be maintained by uh, putting um, stress on the reed by biting, for example, which is that most kids bite because they don't have enough lip muscles to sustain the shape of the embouchure. Okay, so um, the, the, uh, what, you, what you're trying to do is to, to assist them to develop the strength there, which means that you encourage them to practice every day for short periods of time, just like any athlete in training their body to uh, be stronger would actually uh, uh, practice regularly and not too long and have good rest periods so that the muscle memory can be, um, can be learned by, this, by the cells in the, in the, in the muscles there. The other thing is, obviously, is that you need to be very strong with your abdominal muscles. And for both, for, for oboe and bassoon, it's critical that you take a good breath of air because, you, because if you don't, then you'll end up with the upper body tension. And the, the, the trick for that that I've discovered is, is that you, you say the word hot, you take note of the vowel shape that you make when you say the word hot, and you breathe in with that vowel shape. And if you do that now, you should probably feel your abdominal muscles kicking in. The muscles which are uh, the, around the, the, the circle around the top of your hips. 
and as, as double read players and as any wind players, we actually need to be using utilizing that ring of muscle, which corresponds to the center of Leonardo da Vinci's man. Remember the one in the in the circle? That that's the that's the ring of muscle, which uh, corresponds with the the center of that diagram. There's also if you go backpacking, if we ever get into rural Victoria ever again then you'll find that carrying your backpack is those muscles which, uh, which take the weight, it's not the shoulder muscles. If you, take, if you bear the weight of your backpack on your shoulders, you'll be tired at least four times quicker than if you take the weight on the abdominal muscles down the bottom. Okay, anyway, so that's, that's the, uh, so with, with the Oberon bassoon, um, you look for ways of encouraging them to retain their natural lack of tension in their upper body. I find that you really have to be onto this with the boys when they hit years um, uh, around about eight and nine, because they, they get the idea through peer pressure that they have to be strong. And strong means that. And it's, uh, and that, it's that strength, uh, that bicep and, and upper, upper uh, torso strength is useful in many situations, but it's not useful in double read playing. And so you, you, you have to find ways of uh, enabling them. When you say blow strongly, you'll find that they tend to go, okay. <clears throat> and you need to, this is where the hot comes in handy because you can't, you won't do that if you've um, taken the breath in in the first place in, that, in a reasonable manner. As I said, this, this thing weighs a kilo, the bassoon weighs um, a heck of a lot more, but not all, not all that much in, uh, surprisingly, but it, it, it weighs more, but it just happens to be bigger. And so in the bassoon, it's a matter of encouraging a balanced position. And, and, the, and you'll find that then the notion of actually taking the head, keeping the head balanced and taking the instrument to the head is something that will have to be reinforced all the time because the urge to do, put the bassoon there and then go like that is huge. So they're right from the start, then we're, 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 we're constantly reaffirming things which uh, assist relaxation. And with relaxation will come the tone, will come the tuning and everything else that we want, technical development. It's, it's, it's the root of everything. Um, when, you, when you're starting, I don't talk about embouchure on oboe or, or bassoon at all, or what, what, I, what I focus in on and is uh, having something work. And so on oboe, if I can just find where I've put it. I, I, I don't know where it is right now, but I, I actually use a reed, which is um, a long scrape reed. We don't play that generally in, in, uh, in Australia. There, have, there, has been one or, there have been one or two players. I think you can, I did have it, there it is. There have been, uh, Mark Eagling was one, I don't know if you remember Mark, but he played long scrape. Um, okay, if I put this close to the camera, can you see this? You see how the cane is taken off all the way down to the bottom? Okay, this is, a, a, this is as opposed to a read like this one. It's a short scrape. I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted here, you know all about that. There's the short scrape read. You can see that the, the bark is, been taken off only um, to a, a, for a small segment of the, the scrape, whereas here the bark has been taken off all the way down. Now this has got um, a really big advantage for beginners. You don't need a you don't need an embouchure to play this read. All you need is a lot of air, and if you have a lot of air, you will play it in tune. The first of the, the initial experiences I find on oboe and also on bassoon. So I've got a, I've got equivalents on bassoon, which are the e reeds, which are very cheap that uh, you get from Advantage USA, um, and they they you know they they're, they're just really cheap and they 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 they're like these these reeds are they're actually very cheap as well, and so that you can destroy a few of them without breaking the bank, and so uh, but but the, the point about them is is that you. They work even if you just look at them. You almost hold them up to the draft in the room and they'll, they'll sort of work. But, um, but the, the thing is, is that for a beginner player, the worst thing is to actually, you get all excited about your instrument, isn't it? I'm sure you've discovered this. You get all excited about what, you, what you're going to be able to do with this brand new instrument. And then you go, 
and nothing happens. So um, I, I find that the beginning phases that I, I do anything that I can to make life simple. So I make sure that the instruments are working, that they're of reasonable quality, that they're not going to fall apart. That for the little kids that they that, that um, I, if at all possible, I'm using, I'm using something like this one, which is light. I use it with the pole as well, but, 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 uh, but, but small hand keywork. I use short reach bassoon for the little kids. Use uh, use the tenoroon for the really little ones. Uh, there are there are kids who, who happen to be big, so you can, you can introduce them to the bigger instruments. But you can also with the, the you were asking about the synthetic oboes there, Philip. They tend to be lighter. Unfortunately, with the synthetic bassoons, they tend to be heavier. So uh, it, it it doesn't work both ways. So uh, it, you tend to um, go for a um, a wood bassoon. But because the maple is much lighter than the, than what they they tend to make the synthetic bassoons out of, which are like cement, they're, they're just so heavy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, the um, where was I going with this? Yes. And so after after a while, I mean, you might see if they if they're making good progress, you might discover that within six months, even three months, even earlier, then you're shifting them onto. Uh, uh, an oboe, which is an uh, oboe reed or a bassoon reed, which has got more strength to it, and it's more like what they're going to play. And there are numbers of different types of those reeds round, right? You, you know, the, the, for an oboe, you can get the KG reeds, you can get the um, the rad reeds, you can you get um, the uh, betelo reeds, uh, you know, rico reeds. There, there are tons of them that which will be of the of a reasonable strength. And uh, it just uh, depends on the uh, individual uh, likes and dislikes, which ones of those that you get. Um, I tend to these days gravitate a little bit to the rad reeds because I find that they, they create a slightly different, uh, a darker sound for the kids. I mean, they're, they're, uh, all, all reed types have their issues, but, uh, but I've, that's, that's what I'm tending to use for the little kids now uh, what to, as the next step is the soft ones of those. Uh, and, and also the handy thing about those is that they're made in Melbourne, which means that you can actually um, do something immediately about something which isn't quite up to scratch. Uh, don't talk to Andrew immediately about them. Quick question um, about reeds and from, yes. from Jessica about the brand of the long scrape oboe reed. Um, with these ones, uh, they're called the E reed. I don't know if you can see that. Does that is that coming up at all? Probably not. Just hold no, it back no, a no. bit. Just hold it back a little bit further. Yeah, there we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, it's called the oh. E-Read. It's, it's, it's by Advantage USA, which is an American company. And uh, this one's a blue one, and it's, 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 I think it's a medium strength, which is great. They also do an orange one, which is uh, very light indeed. But I, I find this lasts quite a long time. You know, that, can, that can last a couple of months even, that read. I tend to wire them uh, to, to, to make sure that they don't collapse, but I might do that after, after a, a week, say. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. You've got it. Who was that? That was Jess. Someone, someone put it, uh, Shannon put it in. Well done. Uh, thank you, yeah. Shannon, for that. Yeah. There's also, of course, there's also um, uh, Stephen down in uh, Geelong. He's got the uh, Oboe Central and he stocks a wide range of reeds, including his own and uh, they're, they're also really terrific reeds. So uh, they come, they, those ones, as another homegrown one comes, they come highly recommended. But I don't think he, he doesn't do these ones, but just the, the e-reeds. And another quick question about the brand of the oboe pole. Um, my husband makes those. They, they, he, he made, he actually, I got him to make them because the, the maker over in the States who I was getting from, from decided to retire. And so there was no one else in the world who was making them. So I said to Tom, make me the pole. So if you want one, just let me know. <laughs> or else you can, you, can, I can, you can have a look at one and you can get someone, to, someone of your choice to make them. <laughs> but, no, but I got him to make them in total self-defense. And so um, that one that I showed you with the, for the ring, I'll, I'll just get the other one. Okay, they come differently. So can you can you see the loop at the end? 
Okay, so what I do, can you, can you see that? Can you see, I don't, I don't hook it on the thumb rest, I hook it on the screw there. So easy come, easy go like that. No, and there's no damage being done, although it goes, goes perfectly well on there. You can adjust the heights. So it's got a, you just adjust the height there to whatever you want. And as they grow, the pole gets longer. No, so, and, and this one is for the, for the ring oboe. So I use this, so I've got to the point where if I practice for long periods of time, then it stresses my hands. So, um, so I just use this for practice. It's great. So, and I've, 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 I've given a lot of, I've given these, to, I think, the, um, who, who is it, Jess, who is it in Vienna? Who, they're, they're black, the girl black. Oh, yes, uh, Emma? Emma, Emma Black, that's right. So, so I, I sent her one of these because she needed something to help her out with her hand. So she's, she's, she uses one of these in practice. On, in practice. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the, the, the thing that I find most important for young oboe players, actually, apart from anything else, but, um, is that, that the ex, well, there's two things. One is that you will that to maintain the expectation that they're going to do well. You know, you've just got, you've just got to make that, and the, the, the bassoonists, there's not so, it's not such an issue. They, they seem to be, um, I just think that they can, the over, bassoon is much easier in the long run because it, it, it just functions easier. But for the oboes, then the, it, they, they do need a positive environment. And that's it's important to remember at all times. It's not that you tell them that they're, they're, that they're sounding amazing or anything like that, but you, you put the future there with them. And you tell their parents in particular about the, the fact that they're going to uh, take a long time before they really shoot off but if, but if they but you assure them and if they if they uh, get their fundaments of playing and their relaxation organized that they that they will achieve like everybody else so we, we don't need uh, Amos a in grade five like the pianists but it's a reasonable expectation that they, that, they, that they will have it but before they finish school if they if they really sit there and do things properly. You know, we don't even, I don't talk to them in that those terms. I just say that they'll actually get a lot of enjoyment out of their playing the oboe and be able to do what they play, what they want, when they want, how they want. That's the main thing that they can do those three things, play what they want, when they want, how they want. Okay, but, but the underpinning all of this apart from maintaining the, the, the relaxation is reading skills and rhythm skills. Now, the, the young oboe has enough to contend with with um, managing their instrument, uh, uh, apart from the, the obvious thing, which is that they need to know how, how to decipher what's on the page in front of them. Now, the, the, there's two reasons for this. One is, is that the oboe repertoire is not immense. And, um, you know, we, uh, and also we don't, we don't tend to spend huge periods of time just on one piece. We do need to move them on. And so a flexibility with reading and with understanding rhythm, I find really aids their, their technical development. Because uh, quite often too, when you get them in a band situation, they're being confronted with multi flats. And where the, uh, there's obvious reasons why that is. You know, there's far more, far more many clarinetists in the group than there are anybody else and so that they, they're in comfortable keys. And so what I, what I suggest is that, um, that a lot of emphasis should be on uh, sight reading, on being able to, uh, I, I get them to write their note names in uh, uh, for long periods of time if that's what they want to do, anything to get them reading and feeling comfortable with, with actually reading the music because the worst thing is that they memorize things and then just look blankly at the music because they, they're, they're sending so many schizophrenic messages through to their brains by doing that. It really impedes the, the, the learning process for becoming literate. And so I find the, uh, the, 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 the process of getting them to write their notes in, they get so bored and upset with the length of time that that takes that it speeds up the learning process. So I do, I do encourage them to do that at the, at the be beginning. And, and if, if they come up with that solution for how to read music, I say, fine, you do it. Anything that gets them to become musically literate, 
Now, the other thing is to put a heavy emphasis on being able to play in time. Because that's the other thing, because once they get into an ensemble, they're going to stick out. And so it's a good idea for everybody concerned that they're the ones that know how to play with a good, with good rhythm. And so uh, uh, there are good texts that, that will deal with that. You know, I'm a big fan of the Blow the Oboe by Sue Taylor because uh, that, that's, that's addressed in that book at every turn alongside with, with tons of repertoire so that they've got no excuse not to, not to be moving forward in the book and reading lots of stuff. So I, I find that having a, 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 a tutor book, which is uh, in my favorite tutor book by the, the Cockcroft one is also a really good book full of tunes, which um, should be perpetuated I keep asking the, the kids, do you know this tune? No. But I say, well, you should. Here it is. Play it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole generation out there that don't know Walsing Matilda, believe it or not. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, oh, yeah, yeah, you have to believe it because it's quite true. Yeah. Anyway, so that's on that, that topic. I noticed that, um, uh, now, the next thing I had down with here was, that, is it essential to have a specialist teacher? The short answer, no, but it helps. The, the main thing is to know where to get help from if you don't have a specialist teacher. And also that there's so many, there's so many um, videos and the helps on the web these days. There's no excuse not to be informed if you're not an oboe uh, a specialist oboist or specialist bassoonist. I can really recommend any of the videos by Terry Ewell for bassoon. E W E W E E L L. He's a uh, he's one of the professors at one of the universities over there. He's an ex president of the double, International Double Reed Society, and his um, his uh, whole series. I, I look at them to learn how to double tongue on uh, on oboe, for example. Even though he's, uh, he's dealing with bassoon, but he, they're entertaining and extremely well thought out and extremely well presented. So if you want any information on playing bassoon and teaching bassoon, I would recommend those. Oboe, they're, they're, they're a dime a dozen on the web. You, know, you just uh, sift through and, and take the information that you want. And then you can have phone a friend like Jess here. You know, you just ring her up and say, hey, Jess, I've encountered this problem. And Jess says, right, okay, well, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there's, but there are, there is a, there's a lot of, there's a, a, anybody in Melbourne, you, 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 just, you just ask. As, as a as a double replant and Paul, you play you play very good oboe, so you know you know what you're doing. You've also played bassoon, and Shannon, you're going to be you know, you're playing a very good oboe too. So there's no reason why that, but the so-called non-specialists can't teach very uh, a very good oboe, and I think it should be encouraged at the moment to, because um, you know it's I you know every, everybody here is probably. <laughs> got at a place where there is oboe teaching going on but there's a lot of places where there isn't oboe teaching going on where there could be and so if you come across those situations then I think they should, people should be encouraged. Um, I've got down here how can you tame a young oboe so I wrote that down because um, and particularly with oboe you, they have to be allowed to play forte and I'm sure everybody's have been through this experience if they are, are not allowed to play forte at the, particularly in beginning phases they will not learn to uh, produce a pain tune for a long time. They'll have trouble playing with a good sound. They'll have trouble technically. There'll be all these problems because as I, as I kept on saying beforehand, it's a stick it in and blow instrument, which you, which you learn to manage. Okay. And the, 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 it, it comes from, the piano comes from knowing how to play forte well. You learn to play softly as a result of knowing how to play loudly. And you can demonstrate this, uh, the effect of this, by, by singing a, a diminuendo and keeping the vocal cords going. Ah. When I do that, I immediately notice that I have to increase the support. I'm doing it by slowing my airflow up. I'm not doing it by reducing my airflow. If I reduce my airflow, my vocal cords will stop vibrating and end up with a <sighs> happening. The, the oboe read and the bassoon read function exactly the same way. And so just uh, to get a handle on how to do a diminuendo with your voice is, a, is, a, is a, you go a long way to getting a handle on how to do it on the double read instrument. 
but it takes a while to get to a situation where you can actually manage to read well enough to actually be enough in control with the, what, what you have to do with the lip muscles to support what's going on without squishing the read and things like that. So you allow, you allow young double readers to play loudly. And in fact, you encourage it and you help them with their mouth shape by tucking the top lip over. A lot of people talk about the whole mouth thing, but I find that if you just simply ask them to pull their top lip over their teeth and say, oh, that the bottom lip will do what do its thing. The trick then is to maintain that shape. Now, one thing they have to realize is that the, the muscles that maintain the shape for Oban bassoon is actually the side muscles. It's got nothing to do with the top muscle. It's actually the side muscles which maintain it. By pulling the top lip over, you actually kick the side muscles into gear and then you keep the teeth apart. And so on bassoon, they talk about whistling and, you know, and, and dropping the jaw. That's the, that's the bassoon on bassoon. It's a whistle or drop the jaw. On oboe, you actually do keep the jaw apart, but you just but you do it by pulling the top lip over. And that's the simplicity of it. Some people talk about pulling the, 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 the corners of the mouth, the points of chin and all sorts of that sort of thing. I just reckon that you keep it as simple as you can and uh, get them out of the get the young oboists out of the shouting phases by, by, by just helping them to get their, their, get the scrape of the reed covered with the lips. And then on bassoon is slightly different. You, you, they, they play slightly in front of the mouth front of the teeth, whereas the oboist plays between the teeth. But if you look at the American players, you realize that with their long scrape reads, they are playing a, a lot in front. They're much more in front of the, of the teeth than the European oboist, who tends to play much between and sometimes even a little bit back. And that's a, and hence the difference in the production. The, the ob it's a very upper partially sound that you get with the traditional American sound because of the placement of the lips. And the, the uh, European sound is much more emphasis on the fundamental and, and much less of the upper half partials in the sound. And that's the, that the, the, the read also works better, the, the short scrape works better if you've got the lip further over. So they've developed a way of, the, the Europeans have developed a way of getting cutting off the upper partials to get that much more fundamentally based sound. But the American, the traditional American sound, it really loves the upper partial. Yeah, it's it's uh, often described as being rather a hollow sound because there's uh, there is the lower partial, but we have the upper partials much more. The European sound has got more filling and chops the top off. Okay, the the other the other thing to just uh, I keep coming back to is that when you're developing a young player, then you're asking you're allowing them to play forte, but you have to give them confidence at the same time because their colleagues in, in the flute and the, and the clarinet department are all playing quietly. They're not playing loudly. And here's this oboist really pushing out the sound. And so then we come to this question of, okay, how can the ensemble, and particularly the band conductor, cope with these more beginning double reads? Okay, because they've got, the, they've got these clarinets and these flutes who are producing these small, uh, the flutes playing rather flat, the oboes are tending to go sharp if they're not careful because they've got, they're, if you, you might have discovered that they've, they've actually got tension in there because they're worried about being in the band. So they're up there, their shoulders have gone to meet their earlobes and uh, so up goes the pitch. Um, and so, uh, and they've got the clarinets there who are producing very uh, quiet sounds as well. And so um, I find that there's two things that you need to do to help the double reads, particularly the ones that are having the first band experiences. One is put them on the, on the, uh, the right hand, the conductor's right hand side of the group. Next, uh, put the bassoons next to the second line and the oboes next to the first line. So they're, they're next to the audience. Don't worry about your audience. Now there's one reason for doing that is that they have a better shot at hearing, this, hearing themselves there than they do in front of the brass section and a rampant saxo saxophone section. Because having talked about the quietness of the clarinets and the, and the flutes, who they are normally placed beside in the center of the group, both, both play quietly, 
they they feel that they have to play quietly because of those but and, and when them uh, and so they're behind a rock and a hard place they've got these really loud sounds coming from behind can't hear themselves properly so they have no idea what they're doing half the time except that they know they have to play quietly because of the people beside them anyway so i find that the best place for them is to put them on the end of the row at the, on the, at the right hand side of the conductor soon second over first and you'll find that that's um I mean, I've, I've always thought that, and then I was looking, hunting around today for some um, uh, uh, band configurations, and lo and behold, there was a big, there was there as a beginner band suggestion by someone else. So, like I say, it's not just me it's suggesting that. When they're uh, when they're more in charge of what they're doing, then by all means, put them put them in the in front of the conductor, in the middle of the front row, in the second row. Okay? Or you might even put bassoons next to the bass, uh, the baritone saxophone. Or next to the bass clarinet or something like that but but the oboes can go in front uh, once that once they're in charge of what they're doing and they've also developed the capacity to play quieter so uh that's the main thing now, now for the conductor um that's the seating now i i always think that to get also it's it's wise to actually have single stands for double reed players and not get them to share there are the other reason for having them on the end is that they can spread out a bit and one of the big challenges is that a flute player plays like that can get really close to the stand. The clarinetist plays down, can get really close to the stand. The um, uh, oboist needs to hold the instrument up. Okay, the bell, uh, sh they should be far enough away from the stand that they don't hit the, the edge and lip of the stand with the bell. And uh, so when they, when they lift it up, but the bell should be underneath the lip of the stand. And so that so that and quite close to it so up like that now if you're sitting uh, cramped in the middle of a band you end up finding them down like this half the time and so all the good work that's gone into trying to get them to have great posture is lost in the band setting okay so that's the other reason for getting getting the younger ones the the, the more junior ones on the end so that they can actually sit up and have enough space and not be sharing a stand so they're looking sideways at a funny angle at that sort of a casso like um, look at the conductor while they're trying to see the, the music out of one eye and the, the, the conductor over there somewhere okay so i find that to be really important the other thing is is that uh, they need to have equipment that's working and so so many oboes that at the beginning they, they only have one read and so it's really, really important to be checking with the with the, these young oboes. Have they got three reeds in their box? The two of which can replace the one they're currently on quite comfortably if something happens. Because oboes, reeds, and bassoon reeds, uh, bassoons should also have their second reed, third reed. Um, you know, it just takes one person to turn around and say, "Oh, how are you today?" That's the end of the reed. You know, uh, it's 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 so fragile and and. Uh, the, and you can't expect other instrumentalists to look after an oboist read for them. So you, you have to be ready for accidents. Um, oboists also uh, are required to play often in three, four flats at, a, at an early stage. The E flat is uh, introduced early on. Make sure that they're on an instrument where they can actually reach the thing. Make sure that make sure that their read is working. And above all, make sure that their, their instruments are working. They have to be they're overhauled regularly. The oboes that, that have the most complicated uh, um, key work of any of the woodwind instruments, unless of course they're playing one of these things, which have got the simple system, nothing much can go wrong there. They just have to be over, they'll make sure that they're sealing every now and again. But um, uh, they, the, the, and also the, the the thing on those ones they don't have the side keys and when when the little kids go for e flats they tend to push on the side g sharp and they tend to push on the side octave key and so they have they have to be really uh, uh comfortable with that and then then they can play e flat and if, particularly if they've got little hands they can play e flat fine on one of these junior oboes the rocket oboes yeah. so it's the, the equipment's all important then the other thing is the conductor has to know something about the double reed so that they can troubleshoot and so it's it's to uh, it's to the advantage of anybody who's dealing with the young double reeds to make sure that there's uh, 
material available so that the person who's taking the ensemble, who often is a brass player or something totally different, knows that it has a series of questions that they can ask. Is your reed working? Take it out and blow on it and, send, and, and see if it makes a sound. Okay, it does, right. Can you play? And then we just go to B, A, G. Yes, okay, everything's okay with the top register. Can you play F sharp, then E, then D? Oh, you've got a problem because we can't get below F sharp. All right, okay. Um, we will we'll know that we have to fix your oboe because even if the kid doesn't play for the rest of the call, at least if there's, there's, we know that it's not a problem with the player, there's something wrong with the instrument and we know sort of what it is, go and get it fixed. Okay. Um, you're playing too sharp. Oh, okay. Sit up. Does that fix it? Get your oboe up. Does that fix it? Okay. Is your reed closed? Okay. Gently open it. You know, there, there are all these things with the bassoonist. Okay. Have you, have you got your seat strap caught in your bottom vent key? Oh, yes. Oh, right. That's why I can't play any low notes today. You know, it's, it's just it's just simple things like that. It's just knowing the, uh, the, 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 the troubleshooting questions. Again, if people go on the web, there's oodles of information. You just look up, look up double read troubleshooting and you'll come across all sorts of stuff. Yeah, that they can use. And finally, because I, I think we're probably um, having talked your ear off. Um, it's uh, and the one other thing I'll talk about the, the COVID world. Okay. There's, um, there was a big campaign run, which Kevin will be very familiar with, about uh, uh, aerosols and, uh, uh, and double reads. And actually, the um, oboes and bass trombonists were, were highlighted for quite some time there as being as the most evil of evil aerosol instruments. Um, uh, the, the campaign resulted in the DHHS moderating its language so that uh, woodwinds, brass and singing uh, are, now, are now talked about in very vague language and it's sort of left up to people's personal uh, opinions about um, how to manage it in schools. Uh, I have a, uh, an article which I can circulate if you wish, if you want to see the latest research, which is a German study which was done on aerosols in, in these instruments which um, uh, states very plainly what the state of play is, so that, uh, that uh, the playing woodwinds with these instruments is actually less of an issue than, um, than speaking, normal speaking, same with singing. So if anybody wants to get that, then uh, just let me know and I can forward that article on to you. Um, the, what the DHHS uh, says is what the DHHS says, but I just think that if, if people want to be well informed, then uh, that that's, that may, may may be his assistance, but the DHS has been very uh, of, of assistance, and this has moderated their language so that, quite frankly, the, the you can actually in normal uh, in most circumstances undertake indoor uh, activity on on these instruments and with singing. Um, people have experimented with various masks. Uh, again, uh, there's there's really not much to be said for these masks, except that they they probably made people feel at, uh, much better. There's some quite hilarious photographs on the web. I thought I would just uh, if you'll indulge me, share one with you or two with you. So excuse me while I get that up. Um, I must say that they seem to have disappeared somewhere. So I'm not going to be able to show you. So that they, they, they disappeared off the face of this. But um, you'll, you'll find that there's, that there's a great picture on the web of an oboe with a mask on, with a mask up over here. It's on there, and there's a little slit up like that. And then there's the oboe stuck in here. And it, look, it looks hysterically funny. And there's another one there of bassoonists who've actually created horse masks. So they're, they're, they're dressed up as, as horses, completely covered with little eye holes. And, and they the, the stuck the bassoon in a, in a, in a, in a, a little hole there. The, with, and so they, they've actually got horse heads as they play. It's, it's really hysterically funny. But anyway, um, masks um, are, are, are unfortunately little assistance. But what is of assistance is the condensation that comes out of the instruments. And so if you're, if you're talking uh, about being COVID 
compliant, then it's much better to deal with any condensation that's coming out of the instrument. And uh, some people have uh, have cloth mats, for example, the disposable mats, that the mats that the kids play on. Um, just making sure that there's general sanitation, no sharing of instruments, no sharing of reeds. As a as a uh, as a teacher dealing with the reeds, um, you know. You have to take, bear in mind that, that maybe, you, maybe you will, maybe you won't actually test a kid's read. It might be better just to uh, bite the bullet and, and say, okay, let's, let's just change the read rather than trying to adjust a, a read for a bassoonist or an oboist. Um, I recommend uh, to the kids that they, uh, to the students that they clean their reads out regularly, they wash them so that there's less chance of something, of any, anything being in the reads that, that might be uh, problematic. Um, you, all you have to do is, is you can get a pipe cleaner or you can get a, I, I use a small feather, a bird feather. There's lots on the ground that you can pick up and you just, from the cork end, you just, of an obo reed, you just scrub the inside out with uh, soap and water, if you like. Um, apart from that, um, uh, distancing, I mean, uh, that, that really helps with stand setup. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the band should be distanced anyway, so give people a fighting chance to hear each other help posture. So I think that there's a big advantage in the COVID world of, uh, of distancing for, for uh, woodwind players and, and ensembles. So uh, uh, hopefully gone are the days of sitting crouched together over maybe one or if not uh, two, if not three to a stand sometimes. It's a terrible idea. Um, yeah, and the other, and I guess the only other thing is, is that um, teaching online it is quite possible to actually have quite success I, I find quite successful lessons there's nothing replaces the one-to-one -one lesson but uh, some schools they've, uh, they've got screens that they uh, suggest you use but I, I just make sure personally that that we're both faced in the same direction distanced and that um, and that I've, I find that the best thing for the development of a young player is to play duets with them and you can do this online too. So, uh, and, and then if you allow the, allow the kids just to, to remain, uh, or the young person to remain relaxed, have confidence that what they're doing is in the right direction, that they will be success, as successful as they want to be with perseverance, that, you've, uh, that you uh, have good habits of practice instilled. And, it's, and it has to be start right from the beginning with the, with the parent, with parental help. And that right from the beginning, they know correct ways of putting instruments together, read care, and all those sorts of things. Then you will, uh, uh, without doubt, the Obos and Bulls and Bassoonists will be happy campers and contribute to every school situation. So I think we'll bring it to a close there. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and for listening to it all.